Welcome back to Hashtag Sisters in Law with Jill Wine Banks, Joyce Vance, Kimberly Atkins Store, and me, Barb McQuaid. You know, there's no better time to get your Hashtag Sisters in Law merch. We have hoodies perfect for the cold weather, t shirts for the gym or warmer climbs, and our new mug. Just click the link in the show notes or go to politicon.com slash merch today. This week, we'll be talking about the latest news in the Trump legal cases, Trump's latest birther conspiracy, and the report from the Justice Department on the Uvalde tragedy. But first, I want to thank my sisters-in-law. Each one of you has agreed to serve as a moderator for a talk I'm doing during my book tour. I'm so grateful. Thank you. I guess the first one uh, who will be doing one of them, you know, my book comes out February 27th on disinformation and um, I'm going to travel around and have some live talks and book signings. And the first one's going to be in Washington, D.C., where Kimberly Atkins store at Politics and Prose will be my interlocutor. Kim, I'm so grateful. I am so excited. You know, I've told my friends, I have friends that aren't just coming to the D.C. tour, but people I know um, in the cities that you are touring all over are going to be showing up. So you're, you're going to you may be approached by a lot of strangers, but they love you, Barb. <laughs> if they say Kimberly Atkins store sent them, I'll be happy to talk to them. Yeah, that's fun. And then um, a couple of days later, I'm off to Chicago where I will be at the seminary co-op bookstore with Jill Wine Banks. And just like Kimberly, I am (laughs) thrilled to be doing this with you. The book is fabulous, so it's really easy to promote it. And because you posted the list of your tour cities, I've been getting calls from people saying, how can I get in? I want to be there. Do I have to buy a ticket? What do I do? So is there anything special for me to tell those people? You know, they can go, an easy place to send them is barbaramcquade.com. And it has um, a list of all the tour dates and uh, you can click on the particular show and it'll tell you all the information you need about whether you need a ticket and when to come and all that sort of thing. So thank you. Um, And then I jet off to the West Coast. I'm going to be in Seattle for a day and Joyce is kind enough to um, come out there to join us with a group of friends who are going to join up for the show in Seattle. And then uh, like a groupie, she's going to follow me to San Francisco and she's going to be on stage with me as the moderator for the San Francisco show. Joyce, that's going to be so much fun. Yeah, I'm looking forward to being a Barb McQuaid groupie. Um, (laughs) I want the t-shirt. I hope that we don't have to take drugs like Grateful Dead groupies. I'm assuming none of that will be happening. With the clean show. Um, But you know, Barb, I mean, really, you're very brave to do this because I'm not planning on reading you a nice script of questions. I love the book (laughs) and I love the topic. I think disinformation and how we handle it is a big deal. I plan on grilling you and getting some suggestions for the future. All right. Very good. Well, bring it on. Well, thank you very much, sisters. I, I really look forward to spending time together with all of you in all of these great cities. Kim, you've had some personal experience with identity theft, haven't you? You know, I have. I've I've mentioned before that I was the victim of a terrible identity theft scheme where multiple credit cards were opened up in my name without my knowledge, and tens of thousands of dollars were charged on these cards. I mean, they had ridiculous uh, limits at the time, and it took years to straighten that out. But even more recently... Uh, I was checking my credit report like I do at least once a year. And there was a credit card that I never recognized on my report. Mm. I mean, it wasn't in arrears or anything, but it's like, I don't, I don't have a credit card from this particular bank. Um, I don't know how it got attached to my report. And I had to go through some rigmarole to uh, make clear that that wasn't me making those charges too. And that's why I think it's really important for everyone to protect their credit, be uh, mindful of what's happening because it can happen so easily without your knowledge. Yeah. You know, your personal information is out there for anyone to find. Data brokers scrape public tax records and sell that information legally, making it accessible to anyone. So when privacy is paramount, we are thrilled to partner with Aura. Aura is an all-in-one online safety solution that helps protect you and your family from identity theft, financial fraud, and online threats before 
they happen. With Aura, you can rest easy knowing that someone's looking out for you. The app scans the dark web. You don't want to go on the, I don't know, I don't even know how to get on the dark <laughs> web, but you don't have to. This app does it for you. And it looks for your email addresses or your passwords or your social security number, any sensitive information that can be floating around there. And if anything is found, you'll receive an alert in real time. And if you're a victim of identity theft, their experienced white glove fraud resolution team will help you navigate credit bureaus, help you initiate a credit freeze or a lock, and work with you around the clock to resolve it. Aura offers a suite of tools to protect you and your loved ones, including real-time alerts on suspicious credit activity, computer virus protection, parental controls, a VPN, and a password manager. It's a comprehensive safety solution that provides almost every tool you'll ever need all in one place. Aura also helps reduce annoying robocalls, telemarketers, and junk mail by sending takedown requests for you regularly on your behalf. So what are you waiting for? That's for sure. That is such a good benefit. And even better, for a limited time, Aura is offering our listeners a 14-day trial plus a check of your data to see if your personal information has been leaked online. All for free when you visit Aura.com slash sisters. That's Aura.com slash sisters to sign up for a 14-day free trial and start protecting you and your loved ones. Again, that's A-U-R-A dot com slash sisters. Certain terms apply, so be sure to check the site for all the details. And of course, you can find the link in our show notes. So full disclosure, I was observing much of this week's legal news about Donald Trump while uh, dealing with a very high fever. I mean, it was so high that I literally was having hallucinations. You know how that's like. But now that I'm feeling a bit better, I don't sound great. My apologies. Um, A lot of it still seems too weird to be believed. So I'm going to need you all to help me (laughs) understand it. Barb, I want to start with Trump's appearance at the E. Jean Carroll trial. And this is a defamation case where a jury is tasked with determining damages. In other words, just how badly Carroll was harmed by Trump's claims. It's it's already been determined that he defamed her. Uh, But he said that she was a liar and worse, and they're determining just how bad that damaged her. Putting aside for a moment Trump's comportment, we'll get to that in a minute. What did you think of the case he made to try to avoid a massive damages judgment? Yeah, this is like the most arrogant defense in the history of time. (laughs) His defense is um, her reputation wasn't damaged by things I said about her. In fact, her reputation was enhanced because I defamed her. She didn't have very many Substack followers before any of this, but now she's super famous. She's got more uh, followers on Instagram and more followers. All the I made her famous. She should be paying me. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Only Trump could come up with a defense like that. I don't think it's going to resonate with the jury, um, but it seems to me this is Trump um, being Trump, and I don't mean that to excuse it. In fact, the opposite, uh, Trump trying to demonstrate that he is above the law and trying this case not only before this jury, but to his political supporters to talk about how he is not going to let her get the better of him. So I thought it was incredibly offensive and arrogant. Yeah. So now let's get to that comportment part, Jill. (laughs) Um, You know, I've said this before. If I acted like Alina Habba in a courtroom or if my client acted like Donald Trump, we'd both have some time to think about it in a jail cell after we were held in contempt. But the judges have been showing restraint, including Judge Kaplan in this case. Do you think... Um, that that restraint that the judges are showing by not punishing the lawyers or Trump in any way is a good move. Well, first of all, let me say it's hard to know whether Alina Habba's behavior was worse than Donald Trump's or whether his was worse. But both of them were horrendous. And so you just asked about Trump, who was, as Barbara described, arrogant and ridiculous. And as you described, it did feel like 
I was hallucinating that you can't believe that a defendant would sit in court muttering loud enough for the jury to hear that this was a con job, et cetera. So do I think it was a good move? No, I think it's not effective. I think the jury is going to be very angry with him. Do I think judges are doing the right thing? And let me make a distinction between civil and criminal cases, because in a civil case, there is no need or right to be present. And this is a civil case. So the restraint may not be as necessary as it would be in a criminal case where it's a lot harder to throw the defendant out of the courtroom to, although in a very famous Chicago case, the Chicago 7 trial, uh, Bobby Seale was bound and gagged. First, he was removed from the courtroom. And because of issues of whether he had to be present for his own trial, he was brought back into court, bound and gagged. So (laughs) it, it is possible, even in a criminal case. But I do think it's probably a wise part, and this is going to anger many of our listeners. I know that if my husband listens to this one, he'll be yelling at me for days because he thinks it's ridiculous that Donald Trump is getting special treatment, and he is. And, you know, Joyce, Trump has been hopping back and forth between courtrooms and campaign stops. You know, he, he gets off a plane in Iowa and lands in New York. And to what extent do you think his legal strategy has been shaped by his campaign strategy? And what do you think this means for the outcome of these cases? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, it's all campaign strategy, right? I mean, that's what Trump has going for him. Um, and, and it might be okay, frankly, in the E. Jean Carroll case, where the only thing that's in doubt is how much money he's going to end up having to pay her. It is a foregone conclusion that the $5 million he owes from that first case is now going to be added to. Um, It's probably going to be a whopping sum. And his political and legal strategies, I think, line up pretty well in this case. Claim the judge's bias, appeal to a higher court, appeal to the court of public opinion. Um, That's how this one will go. That's what he's doing in the New York civil fraud case, too. But it's a much more dangerous strategy when it comes to the criminal cases where his liberty is stake, not just money. And, you know, judges tell jurors in all cases, especially in criminal ones, that they must decide the case based upon the evidence that they hear in the courtroom, the facts, and the law as the judge instructs them on it and nothing else. And jurors do a remarkably good job of understanding that instruction and deciding those cases. I think the cumulative effect of Trump's shenanigans will add up against him. It will make him look more guilty, not less so in criminal cases. I mean, you know, yes, maybe he'll make a political argument to his base. Maybe he'll fundraise off of what he does in court. But when it comes down to whether he goes to prison or not, I don't believe jurors will be impressed by any of this. Yeah. And, you know, Barb, we also got a new filing from Trump's team uh, at the Supreme Court in the Colorado case uh, where the state kicked him off the ballot under the 14th Amendment. Uh, the, The new brief was filed by a fairly new addition to Trump's legal team, Jonathan Mitchell, who is better known as the man behind uh, Texas's vigilante enforcement abortion ban. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all the best people. Um, (laughs) So the filing is basically a rehash of what we've already talked about when they petitioned the Supreme Court to take up this case uh, in the in the beginning. So it wasn't a lot of news there, but an amicus brief was filed that I found interesting. And it was by someone you know, Barb, uh, Michigan Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson. It's in support of neither party, neither Trump nor Colorado, but what she's asking for is really important. Can you explain it to us? Yeah, first let me preface all my remarks by saying Jocelyn Benson is the bomb. We are so <laughs> fortunate in Michigan to have Jocelyn Benson as our Secretary of State. Before she became Secretary of State, she was an expert in election law. She was a law professor at Wayne State University Law School. She became the dean there, and she wrote a book about the Secretary of State position in all 50 states. So she came to this job as an election expert. And, you know, it's only one part of the job. They also administer, like, driver's licenses and do all this stuff. And so what a story of the right person being in the job at the right time, because, you know, Michigan was one of those battleground states where there were all these allegations of fraud, and she handled her work so professionally, so decisively, that I think she she really came out uh, shining and really helped our state 
state get through a very difficult time. So she filed a brief before the Supreme Court, as you note, Kim, and she does not take a position on the merits. She's not saying either Donald Trump should or should not be on the ballot. But what she does say is, for the love of God, Supreme Court, decide this case and decide it fully on the merits and do it quickly. And that's because her job as the administrator of state elections is she's got to print these ballots and get them distributed. And she's speaking for her colleagues around the country who has to do the same thing. I think one thing she raises is not only do you have to decide this and decide it quickly, but you need to decide it fully, which is, and you and I, Kim, have had conversations about this. There's one scenario where the court could say the issue is not ripe during the primaries. Come back when we get to the general and we'll decide this, you know, in September or so. And she's saying, no, 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 like we got to know now because it could be the case that someone casts their vote in a primary election for someone who's not going to end up on the ballot down the road in the general. And that would really be a waste of that person's vote even in the primary election. So decide it now and decide it fully. So that sort of brings me to another question. Now, we usually save all our listener questions till the end, but a couple um, that we've been getting repeatedly that I think is good to be answered here. And Jill, the first one is what Barbara was getting at. We get a lot of questions about why is this taking so long? You know, the briefs were just filed. The arguments won't take place till next month, February 8th. That means the decision will come, I don't know, late winter or even early spring. Why the delay? What is the Supreme Court doing? I gave an answer last week, but a lot of people let me know they didn't like it. So what do you think? (laughs) Well, my husband was one of those people who didn't (laughs) like it. But I defended you because I think you're right. It is actually being handled expeditiously. You know, the, the, one of the past standards of a fast decision was in the Watergate case where Right before trial on April 16th, we subpoenaed tapes and we actually ended up having a Supreme Court decision in July. That's incredibly fast. So I I think this could end up being just as fast as that one was, because here, uh, you know, we started April 16th. We got cert granted on May 31st had oral arguments on July 8th, which was, you know, enough time for everybody to put their briefs together. And we argued on the 8th and had um, a decision on July 24th. That is a really fast decision. And of course, uh, Bush v. Gore was decided even faster because that was really a crucial issue. We didn't have a trial schedule till October. So there was a little bit of leeway there. And I I think in this case, the arguments on February 8th are pretty fast from the time the issue was joined. And if they decide quickly enough, it won't end up interfering with scheduled trials. So I don't think it's such a bad thing. It's it, You need to have everybody have the right amount of time to adequately represent their positions and for the court to give due consideration to both sides. And I think that if they just don't delay a long time after February 8th. It will be timely. Yeah. Thanks for for standing up for me to Michael. Jill, I appreciate it. You know, Joyce, another question that we've been getting a lot is, why are we ignoring the part of the 14th Amendment's Section 3 that talks about aid and comfort? It doesn't just disqualify people who engage in the insurrection, but also somebody who, quote, uh, has given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. Joyce, are we missing it? Is that a slam dunk against Trump? Yeah, you know, this is sort of the equivalent of accomplice liability in criminal cases, right? Principles, the guy who pulls the trigger is responsible for the murder. But so are accessories, both before and after the fact, the accomplices who aid them in some way or or provide comfort to them after they commit their crime. Um, In Colorado, the court apparently thought the case was strong enough to show direct responsibility, and that's where that case is focused with no need to go any other route. But since each state is doing this independently, we could certainly see this crop up in other places. Maybe it will be argued in Colorado's brief or in the amicus briefs in support of Colorado, which aren't due before the Supreme Court until next week. You know, Kim, I'm not positive what the answer to the question is, but I have an instinct that it's this need to only look at this if it's the most serious sort of conduct available. If Trump himself 
engaged in insurrection. And of course, that's what the judge in Colorado found after holding an evidentiary proceeding for five days. She found that the facts supported that conclusion, that it was direct involvement by Donald Trump in insurrection, which is, of course, the best and strongest case for removal. Yeah, I think so, too. I think when it comes down to it, that's not the part of the uh, Section 3 that's going to be a hang-up, if any. Most of the litigation has been around other issues. Is it self-executing? Is the president an officer of the United States? You know, it's all of these other issues. So far, when it's come up, it the courts have not yet been hung up on whether he engaged in an insurrection. I think it's really hard to say that he didn't. Um, And I suspect it'll be one of these other issues that it's hung up on. But stay tuned. We will keep y'all informed or at least give you our take as this continues to go down the line. So, Joyce... I made a resolution this year to do everything I can to save our environment. And I found real paper. And it's really a good thing for the environment and for everyday use. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I really love real paper. I did not know it existed before they started advertising with us. And as I so often find with our advertisers, it's been a great addition. We are a very green conscious household. We do a lot of recycling. We do a lot of composting and we've added real toilet paper to our our best practices. So it's time to embrace this popular American pastime for 2024, building positive new habits. When it comes to new habits to improve your life and our planet, we have a great one, switching to real bamboo toilet paper. If you're still using conventional toilet paper in your home, dump the stuff that contributes to deforestation and switch to Reel's 100% bamboo toilet paper. It's always shipped free to your door in plastic-free packaging. Plus, their hassle-free subscription comes right when you need it. You'll never have to worry about running out or forgetting to run to the store. It's a terrible thing to run out of. Even better, using Real doesn't feel like you're sacrificing to help the earth. It feels like an upgrade, if you know what I mean. It's so soft and convenient after stocking our homes with it. We're never going back. Bamboo is a perfect material for toilet paper. It's amazingly soft and strong. It's loved by pandas, you know, and, you know, it regenerates <laughs> like grass. So we're not killing trees to do something once and just, you know, flush it down the drain. Real also partners with One Tree Planted. That means every box of real that you buy funds reforestation efforts across the country. Other toilet paper cuts down trees. Real helps plant them. Real paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchase on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping in 100% recyclable, plastic-free packaging. You know, I was with Joyce recently at an event. She came out of the restroom and uh, attached to her heel, she was dragging along a bamboo pole. (laughs) 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 <laughs> I thought I'd try that. Um, if you head to realpaper.com slash SIL and sign up for a subscription using our code SIL at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R-E-E-L-P-A-P-E-R dot com slash SIL or enter promo code SIL to get 30% off your first order plus free shipping. Let's make a change for good this year and switch to real paper. Real is paper for the planet. Start making a change for the better with the link in our show notes. So last week, Donald Trump began to turn his attention to Nikki Haley on a number of different fronts. Um, Despite her third place showing in the Iowa caucuses, her numbers in New Hampshire are much stronger and Trump seems worried. Uh, Most of the arguments that he makes against her are political, but one is legal, and I want to talk with you all about that today. It's an argument about her eligibility to hold the office of the presidency, so sort of a good follow-on from that last couple of questions that you asked, Kim. Donald Trump says that Nikki Haley is not qualified to be president of the United States. So, Jill, what's the legal basis of Trump's argument here? Unlike the case for his not being qualified, which is under the 14th Amendment, 
This is actually under Article 2 of our Constitution, which sets three qualifying requirements to be the president. One is you have to be a certain age. One is you have to have lived in the United States for a certain number of years. And the other is that you have to be a natural born citizen. So true to his format, Donald Trump has created a conspiracy uh, theory that says she is not a natural born citizen because her parents weren't citizens at the time she was born. There is no merit to that argument. We have long recognized in America anyone born on American soil, regardless of the status of their parents, is a natural born citizen. So it's ridiculous. Uh, I'm surprised he didn't raise it against our current vice president, whose parents also were not citizens when she was born in America. Uh, he did raise it against Obama, saying that he wasn't a natural born citizen, even though he was born in Hawaii, which was a state at the time that he was born. And uh, so it, it's a ridiculous argument, but that is his new constitutional argument that she is not qualified, as opposed to she's not qualified because of experience. She's not qualified because she doesn't meet the natural born citizen requirement of the Constitution. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating to me, Jill, because you talked about Kamala Harris, and of course, that requirement applies only to the president, not to the vice president. But what do you do when you've got a vice president who suddenly has to become president and they're not eligible? So this is sort of a subtle, multi-layered question, but as you point out, it's utter bunk when it comes to Nikki Haley, who was born in South Carolina. Um but, Barb, what would Trump be doing if he was serious about this argument? I mean, could he take it a step further? Of course he could. If he really thought there was some legitimate question about whether Nikki Haley was truly born outside the United States, he would do exactly what's happening to him, right? He would file uh, a, a lawsuit. He would file a legal challenge in all of these states saying she's not eligible for the ballot. But if he were to do that— he would have to provide proof. And he knows he can't do that. So instead, he is just ginning up disinformation. You know, I actually talk about the birther conspiracy in my book about Barack Obama. Um, it was Donald Trump who, you know, pushed that false claim. And, you know, if you say it enough, there are people out there who think, well, it must be true because who would make up a thing like that? It, there must be some truth to it. So um, if Donald Trump has evidence that Nikki Haley is born out of the United States, put your money where your mouth is, file a legal claim. But he won't because he can't because she wasn't. Yeah. So, you know, Kim, when Trump first made that the Obama birtherism argument, I thought it was ridiculous. I, I can remember hearing it for the first time and thinking, this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Um, it felt non-serious. It felt like something that everybody would just reject out of hand. And of course, that's not what happened. And it still gets some traction even today in some of the darker corners of the internet and American society. So do you think that rather than, I mean, I have Barb's reaction. It's like, this is a bunch of BS. He's never gonna bring a lawsuit because he knows he would lose. Is it wrong to reject it? Do we need to take it seriously? So I think legally or co and constitutionally, we should not take it seriously. I think in terms of um, not just politically, but in terms of our society, we need to take this extremely seriously because, I mean, the gaslighting goes with the racism, right? They're trying to, he is trying to push what he's actually doing is saying, oh, is she eligible to be president? What he's actually saying is she's brown. Do we want someone like that in the presidency? It's a dog whistle that's no longer a dog whistle. It's a, it, you know, it's a loud speaker. Um, and that is what it's about. And because it does have traction with certain elements of his base is precisely why he's doing it. And sadly, because it has traction with certain elements of his base, as Nikki Haley is trying to win this nomination, it is something that she is pandering to, too, by saying, what was the Civil War about? Oh, I don't know. States <laughs> rights. Oh, <laughs> this country has never been a racist country as she tries to uh, live in the White House, which was built by enslaved people, literally. I mean, George Washington, I mean, this is information, by the way, that is all in the White House 
Historical Society. If you don't believe me, go look it up. George Washington was among those on the committee uh, to construct this White House, this People's House. And he originally had a plan that they would try to contract out this work. They would contract it out seeking people in the Americas as well as in Europe you know, craftsmen who can come and actually build the building. And they were all like, no, thanks. We don't want to. And so instead they went with a different plan, not Washington's plan, but a plan to go to the owners of enslaved people in Virginia and Maryland and say, hey, can you loan us out some enslaved people to build the White House? And that's what happened. That is the house that it was built on. I recall Michelle Obama getting dragged by saying how, what a trippy experience it was going to be to live in a house that was built by enslaved people. She was absolutely right. But Nikki Haley can't even acknowledge that. She's like, well, my parents told me there's no racism. So la la. She's pandering. She knows better. She knows better. She actually gave a very good speech when they removed the Confederate flag from the uh, South Carolina State House where she showed that she understood exactly what it meant. So the fact that he is coming for her in the most racist way and she's not even standing up for herself or other people tells you a lot. So that's the part that we should take very seriously. Yeah, you know, I am no fan of Nikki Haley's politics and I'm glad to hear you call this what it is. It's it's not a dog whistle anymore, right? It's racism being shouted out through a megaphone because Trump traffics in fear, he traffics in dissension, he traffics in dividing Americans. It's what has always worked for him and and it's what he's going to go on doing in this case. And I do think we need to take it very seriously. You know, Nikki Haley doesn't. I think we need to take it seriously for her because this tells us volumes about what Trump's second term would look like in this country. All this stuff is so delicious. You make me want to go bake it all right now. I'm eating all this yeah, stuff Yeah, we need to, I need so to order good. some more. Yeah. I just ordered an apple galette. I cannot wait to try that. I'm going to do the that. subscription, that. notwithstanding the goodies we're getting, because I just want those free croissants. Like, that's in every <laughs> box. Like, that's subscription. a subscription. We've got shoot. sourdough bread to go with the chili Bob made for dinner tonight. I mean, we're going to have that stuff yeah. every night. It's great. This episode of Hashtag Sisters in Law is brought to you by Wild Grain the first ever Bake from Frozen subscription box for sourdough breads, fresh pastas, and artisanal pastries. You know what's great about it is you cook it from frozen because I always forget that step of you got to take it out to thaw it. I'm so lazy, like I can't even thaw the frozen foods, but you don't have to with wild grain. Every item bakes from frozen in 25 minutes or less. No thawing required. The team at Wild Grain just sent me a new box and there is so much delicious stuff inside. We need to tell you about it, especially because there's a limited time deal to get $30 off your first box and free croissants when you go to wildgrain.com slash sisters. Hey, Barb, you know what I was doing right before we started the podcast? No, Joyce, what? I was opening a new box from Wild Grain. I was so excited. You know, it comes, it says perishable on the outside. You open it, it's packed really nicely with, with, um, I guess it's dry ice or ice packs in it. So it's fully frozen. And the same thing that you talked about, the fact that I can pull it out of the freezer last minute and toss it right into the oven is what convinced me after Wild Grain sent us a box to try that we needed a monthly subscription. So I just opened a couple loaves of sourdough, some of Kim's pasta. It's possible that some molasses cookies might have jumped into this order too. (laughs) But I am sold on Wild Grain. And I say that as somebody who bakes all the time. I like to make bread and other goodies for my family. This stuff is absolutely fantastic. Have you baked the uh, chocolate chip cookies yet? I have them. That was in our first box. I made them when our our youngest kid was home from college. He raved. I probably need to send him a box at college too. I mean, it's perfect for college kids. All of the pastries are amazing. The croissants are great. There's lots of variety. And the only problem is the problem that I have. Once you pull them out of the oven, it's a free for all in my house to get at them first. Luckily, usually I'm the one who gets there because I do like watching the color and flavor come alive when they heat up in the oven. Wild grain, it's so easy. It's so delicious. It's the perfect combination. You'll want to try everything they have to offer. 
I've had exactly the same experience and was stunned by how good the pasta itself was. Homemade pasta that just was the right texture and the right shape, absolutely great stuff. And the croissants were amazing how they puffed up from a skinny little nothing into the biggest, fattest croissants you've ever tasted. And you can now fully customize your wild grain box so you can get any combination of breads, pastas, and pastries you like. If you want a box of all bread, all pasta, or all pastries, you can have it. I was going to say, but you shouldn't just get all one thing because all the things are so good. Like having a, a variety is your best bet. That's just a tip from me. And another tip, for a limited time, you can get $30 off your first box plus free croissants. Listen, that is a gift. Free croissants in every box when you go to wildgrain.com slash sisters to start your subscription. You heard me. That's free croissants in every box and 30 bucks off your first box when you go to wildgrain.com slash sisters. That's wildgrain.com slash sisters, or you can use the promo code sisters at checkout. And you know what else? You can find the link in our show notes. I know all of you listeners will very well remember the mass shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas in May of 2022. A former student armed with an AR-15 style rifle killed 19 students and two teachers physically injured at least 17 others, and left countless others grief-stricken. The law enforcement response to the shooting was immediately heavily criticized. At the request of then Uvalde Mayor Don McLaughlin, the U.S. Department of Justice conducted a critical incident review of the response in the hopes of providing guidance moving forward. Let me start with you, Kim, and say, Every aspect of law enforcement's response before, during, and after the shooting was analyzed in this report. And the DOJ concluded that the response was disorganized, chaotic, and ultimately marked by failure. What did the mayor, law enforcement, and all of us learn about the failure of that day from the critical incident report? And can it provide guidance to Texas and anywhere else going forward? Yeah, I think it must provide guidance, Jill, just an answer to that last question first. Um, it must provide guidance to every municipality in the United States of America because we know that incidents like this can happen anywhere. So I would suggest that everyone read at the very least the executive summary, which is 32 pages, but you know what? I, I sailed through it because it's written in a way, I mean, it's horrifying. It's horrifying, but it's written in a very accessible way, which I appreciate because it's not just a tool for, uh, you know, lawmakers and, and law enforcement in these municipalities. It's a tool for the public to know what they need to, what they should expect, you know, what they should demand from their officials in this. So um, long story short, the most significant finding was that uh the officials in Uvalde failed to treat this incident as an active shooter situation. Now, since Columbine in the late 90s, we have learned so much about active shooter situations in general and specifically those in schools. So it's really no excuse for Uvalde not to have been aware, at least on the very basic level, how to react. And what it found uh, what happened, I, I listed, I made a list here that said the good and the bad. And the good in terms of how Uvalde responded to this event was that uh, law enforcement arrived within three minutes, uh, entered the school almost immediately and went to the classroom where the shooter was. That's literally the end of the good stuff. Everything <laughs> from that point on yeah. was abysmal. So for some reason, instead of treating this as an active shooter situation, they essentially treated this as some sort of hybrid of a hostage negotiation and a rescue operation. So you had 
the officers were staying outside. So think about it. When there's a hostage situation, what's going on? You have somebody who's holding someone hostage and demanding something, right? So what do you do? You negotiate with them. You try to say, okay, in order for you to give me these people, I'm, I will talk to you. I'm not a hostage negotiator. Obviously, I'm, you know, a journalist and former lawyer, but it, I, I can't. Get, but that's, you get the gist. It's a different, um, it's just a different posture. And if you're rescuing people, you're trying to find ways to get them out of whatever danger they're in. If it's an active shooter situation, you need to go in and try to neutralize the active shooter. It took 77 minutes for law enforcement to actually go inside the classroom where this, these teachers and these kids were, even after arriving and hearing more gunshots. Like what in the what? They're running around searching for keys to evacuate other classrooms. The chief of police went in without his radio. So there was no communication. There was no way to create a plan of what to do. There was no um, uh, source because law enforcement were coming from every, they deployed everybody, local law enforcement, sheriffs, Border Patrol, everybody showed up. So you needed to have a plan of action. You needed someone in charge and you needed marching orders. And there was none of this. They weren't even communicating with each other or with the chief. There was no situational awareness. They didn't know how many students were in, whether they were safe. Students were calling on 911 saying that they needed help and that wasn't happening. So long story short, everything that we have learned in the past several decades since Columbine went out of the window. And that directly, according to Merrick Garland and Vanita Gupta, that directly cost people their lives. Lives could have been saved if they learned the lessons that we already know. So every municipality needs a plan of what will happen in an active shooter situation in a school today. Not They need it yesterday without delay. I think the saddest thing is that there were people who were severely injured who could have been saved if law enforcement and medical personnel had been able to enter. And 77 minutes. Yeah, Think about that. People bled out. Yeah, that that's what's so sad. So Barb, you know, Kim has identified some of the failures, but this report goes into specific details of recommendations. So can you analyze which of those would have made a difference if they had been in place and implemented? Um, and I'm going to also ask Joyce later about how you could implement these uh, recommendations. But first, let's just talk about what are the most significant ones and which ones would have made a difference. Yeah, so, you know, the the, the purpose of this report is really to uh, help the entire law enforcement community. This was prepared by the COPS Office, Community Oriented Policing Services. This is not about assessing blame for purposes of lawsuits. You know, I know some of the families were very upset that this didn't name names. That's not the purpose of this. And there will be, you know, an opportunity for them in civil lawsuits or criminal investigations. This is really about, you know, just they call these after action reports. What happened and how can we learn from this so that this doesn't happen again in some other community? And they have a number of recommendations. And one of them uh, that struck me is it's so obvious and it's already an obvious recommendation, and that is that uh, public safety partners in regions, federal, state, local, school, law enforcement agencies should plan and train and exercise unified command situations for responding to incidents. Uh, When I was in the U.S. Attorney's Office as an assistant U.S. attorney, one of my roles was to be the crisis response coordinator. And we had a plan for dealing with critical incident response. And we would, from time to time, exercise the plan, sometimes with federal, state, and local agencies. We did emergency scenarios on the Detroit River. We did uh, dirty bomb scenarios. We did cyber attacks. We did pandemics, all kinds of things. And the reason is that there is a unified command structure that exists, but everybody has to know how it works and how it works together. So I, I think that if they were to plan and train in those kinds of things, then when the emergency actually strikes, they know what they're supposed to do. They don't have to stand around looking at each other and pointing to each other. Well, one of the other recommendations is that there needs to be a commander who takes charge on the scene. I can imagine that some of these police officers were just frustrated as we are reading about these delays and the 77 minutes that Kim talks about, 40 minutes looking for a key. At one point, they sent a drone down to look in a window to see if they could observe 
the shooter. A um, drone. For, they for, had for, time yeah, to get a drone. A drone. And once they got there, they realized, <sighs> oh, yeah, we can't see in the window anyway because lockdown protocols require closing the, the blinds. So, Lord, have you mercy. know, all this, uh, all of, so I'm sure there were officers saying, let's go. What are we doing here? But what you need is an on scene commander, somebody who takes charge. And there's a protocol for that, too. It's supposed to be the local police uh, official. In this case, it would be the school commander, unless he cedes command to someone up. Perhaps he wants to say, I am ceding control to the local police department, the municipality, and that's fine. But here it was the school uh, police chief, Chief Arredondo, was the incident commander, and he is the one um, who did not take leadership command and control that he was supposed to do. And so if he wants to cede those duties to someone else. He needs to make that clear and communicate that. But if they had been exercising, they would know there's one commander, he's in charge, let's go, instead of having people looking at each other uh, to decide what to do. So uh, there are also certain recommendations about dealing with victims and dealing with medical attention. And I think all of these uh, could have made a difference if they had followed them. And they're, you know, these are, as Kim said, these are protocols that have been around since Columbine, since 1999. I mean, I was exercising them before I was U.S. attorney in the early 2000s. So um, it's uh, if these things had been done, I'm sure that fewer lives would have been lost. And, and less pain would have been experienced by those informed by untrained people, inadequately um, skilled in delivering such bad news. So there's a lot of things that the recommendations are really good. And, and I will post the link to the executive summary because it's an easy read. And I think it will make everyone uh, feel like a lot was accomplished in this report. But then the question is, okay, so here's some recommendations, very specific recommendations. Are they enforceable, Joyce? And by who? Who's going to make local police departments do this? And, and let me just also point out that... Um, the chief uh, Adondo was fired uh, for his bad behavior on that day. Um, so at least there has been some accountability for him. Yeah, so as Barb mentioned, this is an after action report. This is a report that comes out of DOJ's COPS division. That's a group that looks at community-oriented policing and provides technical assistant grants to help with training, provides best practices, provides studies um, and, and techniques for how to do things better. That's the long way of saying that nothing in this is enforceable. This is not something that was done by the Civil Rights Division that might be considering whether to file a pattern and practice case or even bring a criminal prosecution. That's not what's going on here. This report will be studied, I suspect, by every decent-sized police department as it trains officers in every academy in federal law enforcement. This is the paradigmatic example of what not to do, right? I heard Frank Fogluzzi, who for a long time um, reviewed um, shootings for the FBI, did review these sorts of reports. And Frank said yesterday that if he had written this scenario as an exercise, as a tabletop exercise for training for law enforcement, it would have been rejected because there were so many things that went wrong, so many different critical points of failure in the exercise that people would have said that just could never happen. And I think he was dead on the money when he he said that. So part of the tragedy of this situation is that there's nothing that'll bring these kids back. There's nothing that will ease their parents' grief. Um, This is not meant to. This is not meant to punish anyone. It will not be used to hold anyone accountable. The hope here is that this won't happen again. And I'm hoping that police departments will read this and take action to implement it. I know in one of my career paths, I was a consultant. And it's very frustrating because you come in to determine what the problem is, determine what the solutions are, and then you leave. And it's up to your client to implement them. And oftentimes they don't. And that's very frustrating to know the problem and the solution and not to see it happen.
So y'all, I have actually post pandemic for the first time been starting to dress up a little bit again. We've had some events we've had to go out to. Like Barb, I don't really love talking about my undergarments, but I have to say, I've been really happy to have some honey love pieces that I can wear when I dress up. Um, one of my New Year's resolutions was to stop doing things that were uncomfortable. And uncomfortable undergarments are sort of near the top of that list. So we're lucky that support for today's episode comes from Honey Love. Honey Love gets rid of underwires without sacrificing support. You can feel and see the difference and appreciate the comfort. And for a limited time, you can get Honey Love on sale. Get 20% off your entire order at honeylove.com slash sisters. Support our show and check out honeylove.com slash sisters. You'll be surprised by how much you'll love it. Honey Love's crossover bra is very comfortable and gives you all the support you're used to without the underwire. And the mesh detailing is very pretty. You'll want to wear it nonstop and the smoothing fabric ensures it will always be comfortable. Honey Love is also comfortable as sleepwear. It's not just the crossover. They have incredibly comfortable shapewear, tanks, leggings, and other things for everyday support too. Speaking of leggings, Honey Loves Legging 2.0 is making waves. Imagine comfort and compression without that restricted feeling. So whether your New Year's resolution is to be active or spend more time lounging, These leggings are perfect for an everyday look or a workout at the gym. Shapewear should be easy, not suffocating, and Honey Loves products make you look good and feel good. Save 20% off at honeylove.com slash sisters. Use our exclusive link to get 20% off. Honeylove.com slash sisters. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. So please support our show and tell them we sent you. Start the new year with confidence thanks to Honey Love. Look for the link in the show notes. Well, now comes my favorite part of the show, the part where we answer our listener questions. If you have a question for us, please email us at sistersinlaw at politicon.com or tag us at, at sistersinlaw.podcast on threads or tweet using hashtag sistersinlaw. If we don't get to your question during the show, keep an eye on our threads feeds throughout the week where we'll answer as many of your questions as we can. Our first question comes to us from Mary in Wilmington, Massachusetts. Mary asks, is it a common practice to let famous defendants set up cameras directly outside a courtroom to deliver remarks? Kim, what do you think? Oh, Mary, this is one of the many ways where Donald Trump, who claims he's a victim of the court system, is showing that he really is uh, just extraordinarily privileged and is treated. Yes, he's being treated differently by the courts. He's being treated better. I was appalled at every single time he stood inside a courtroom in New York during his fraud trial and with the courtroom behind him, clearly in the building, held what was essentially either press conferences or campaign speeches. No, again, if one of my clients did that in a courtroom in Massachusetts when I was practicing, I mean, it would it, the the security would throw us all out. So, no, famous or not, this is something that I have not seen anyone do except Donald Trump. <laughs> you and me both. Um, Our next question, I'm going to choose a question from Barbara because I like your name, Barbara. (laughs) I'm going to send this one your way, Jill. What happens if a defendant doesn't have the cash for either a cash bond or a bond premium? Barbara and Barbara, I am (laughs) very happy with that question, especially because in January of this year, Illinois changed its rules and abolished cash bail. And that's because it has always applied in a totally discriminatory way and is not a guarantee. Right now in Illinois, you have to show that you are not a danger to the community. And that's all. There is no more cash bail. But in states that still have cash bail or a cash bond or a bond premium, then if you don't pay it, you go to jail and you serve time before you ever get to trial, before you're convicted, you're presumed innocent, but you are jailed 
no matter what, if you can't pay. So it's a very unfair system and other states ought to be looking at the Illinois example and abolish cash bail. Here's a question from Nina in Centennial, Colorado. Joyce, I'll throw this one your way. Since three of Trump's attorneys have quit, will that lead to delays of upcoming trials in order to give new attorneys time to prepare? And was that the plan all along? You know, this is such a great question because as we all know, Trump's lead off strategy is always to play the delay game. But there's an interesting component here when a lawyer has been involved in a case for a period of time and wants to get out of the case just before trial, typically that requires permission from the court. Yes, the client can fire their lawyer, but there's also court engagement on this. And very often the court will condition its approval on a commitment that it won't delay trial. So as we so often say, the answer to this question is really that it's in the hands of the courts. And if they want to proceed in a straightforward fashion, they can do that. You know, the risk is in a situation where a defendant really does need to change lawyers, not saying that that's what's going on here, but sometimes there are good reasons. And then the court wants to be careful that they're not interfering with the defendant's rights to put on a substantive defense. So there is a little bit of a balancing act. But if it's it's clear that it's being done as a ruse, the court can simply say, sure, you can change lawyers. We're still going to trial in a week and a half. Thank you for listening to Hashtag Sisters in Law with Joyce Vance, Kimberly Atkins Store, Jill Winebanks, and me, Barb McQuaid. Remember, you can send in your questions for next week by email to sistersinlaw at politicon.com or tweet them for next week's show using hashtag Sisters in Law. And please show some love to this week's sponsors, Aura, Real Paper, Wild Grain, and Honey Love. You can find their links in the show notes. Please support them because they support this podcast. Please follow Hashtag Sisters in Law on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. And please give us a five-star review. It really helps others to find the show. See you next week with another episode, Hashtag Sisters in Law. Wait, Jill, you were a consultant? Is this a job we didn't know about? What did you consult on? Were you one of those point polite consultants, like a Deloitte or one of those? No, I was um, at a a local Chicago firm and had some really great assignments, one of which actually brought to bear my military background, where I looked at what a private funder was doing for JROTC and ROTC, and um, the largest funder besides the government. And it was a great opportunity to look at what could be done, what was being done that was right, and what would be done that could be improved. It was a a terrific assignment. Um, So yeah, that was was a very short-term thing, but it was a fun filler because I retired and then I thought, I'm not really ready to retire. So this was post-retirement. But then- Are you ready to retire now? (laughs) <laughs> no, I'm not. I mean, obviously, here I am 50 years later, I'm using my undergraduate degree to be on television so and to do this <laughs> podcast. So yeah, it's just one more thing. Jill's never going to retire. 